Welcome to the Final Girls Podcast, where we would do so much more than change the color of our hair if we had the powers of Manon. I'm Anna Bogutska, co-founder of the Final Girls Collective and your podcast host. If you're new to the show, welcome. In real life, the Final Girls put on events and screenings that explore the intersections of horror film and feminism. Our next event is the exclusive preview screening and discussion of Julia de Courneau's Palm d'Or winning body horror masterpiece, Titan. We're screening that film on the 15th of December in London, and I will link the tickets in the show notes. It's going to be real special, probably really weird, and I'm very much looking forward to it. We'll also have Julia on the show with an interview around the UK release of the film, so watch out, there's going to be plenty of Titan content. On the show, we take a horror trope and explore it to death through a series of deep dive discussions into horror and horror adjacent movies. We're currently in the fourth series of the podcast and looking at teen horror, how it's evolved and what makes teenagers and their issues supernatural or not some of the most compelling protagonists in genre. Before we dive into our episode this week, a quick reminder, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Final Girls UK for Nancy supremacy memes, event announcements, and ticket competitions and stuff like that. We also have a Patreon where you can support our work should you choose to and publish occasional bonus episodes. If you don't want to join a Patreon, that's absolutely fine, but we'd really, really appreciate if you could leave us a rating and a little review over an Apple podcast because it really does help people discover the show. And this week's episode is actually a revisit of the film that started the Final Girls podcast way back in 2019. In our very first season, which was about witches, our very first episode was about the craft. It's been a while since then, so I thought, why not revisit the film properly? If, like me, you just cannot get enough of Nancy, Sarah, Rochelle and Bonnie, you can go back and listen to our first take on the craft with Polyester's editor-in-chief Ioni Gamble. But today, I am joined by the wonderful writer, actor, Isora Barbara Brown to dive deep once more into the 1996 Teen Witch movie classic. And with all of that said, please enjoy our take on the craft. I drink up my sisters and I ask for the ability to not hate those who hate me, especially racist pieces of bleach blonde shit like Laura Lizzie. Mm. Right up. I drink of my sisters and I ask to love myself more and to allow myself to be loved more by others. Especially Chris Hooker. I know, it's pathetic. It's definitely pathetic. (laughs) I drink of my sisters and I take into myself the power to be beautiful outside as well as in. I drink of my sisters and I take into myself all the power of Mano. That's all? (laughs) Bring them apart, and it's all very cool um, and magical (laughs) and amazing. And, uh, you know, they punish some people. They do some cool shit, like stuff that like every teen would dream of doing if you had magical powers. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. So let's get into talking about the characters, because you mentioned that they all kind of have very distinct personalities. And I think Mm -hmm. one of the things that we kind of sometimes misremember about the craft is that we all tab them into this like goth teen aesthetic vibe but actually they're all very very different personality wise look wise um yeah even kind of um origin wise like they live very different lives so can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about who all of them are sarah bonnie rochelle and nancy 
Well, Sarah is that kind of one, which I think you could get away with net like in the nineties mm-hmm. in making like, Oh, the pretty rich girl is actually like, you know, they, <laughs> I think we talked about this rule, but like in films, they go, this pretty rich girl is actually having a hard time too, because there's a dead parent. Which is like the real, like, it's like the real, like, film fast way of being like, someone has trauma, um, even though they weren't there for it. <laughs> like, really? Um, they have trauma too. But really, she's, she's, she's okay. She's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also like the most powerful, really, mm-hmm. um, because she's a natural at, at it. So it translates eventually to being the most powerful, um, as far as witchcraft goes. Um, and she's kind of, there's not really a reason she's an outsider. She could be one of the popular girls if she was that way inclined. She doesn't seem to be bothered by it. Mm-hmm. She's just more like goes like marches to the beat of her own drum and like wants to find her own friends, her own footing and all that stuff. Um, and the cool thing about her is that she does like fall in with these girls, which there's lots of reasons why it wouldn't make sense for her. She's new at school. These three girls are like the three weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like yeah i'll hang out with you guys <laughs> um um and i kind of like that even the fact that she kind of goes off on her own to like date chris and like mm-hmm. she kind of makes her own decisions about a lot of the stuff that she's doing so she's quite independent um which plays in her favor later on yes um nancy who is a solid favorite of everyone who watches the film for Absolutely. obvious reasons because mm-hmm. she she is the only real gothy one she's terrifying um, even without witchcraft, <laughs> I think you'd be like quite scared of the Nancy would fight you, um, because she would. Um, and she's like, again, very in a different way to Sarah, marches <laughs> like to like a, a beat of a drum that I don't think anyone's even ever heard. She's like, I don't know, like skinned an animal, made a drum, and beats <laughs> that. And that's like, <laughs> that's Nancy. <laughs> um, she's, um, she's poorer than all the other girls. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, is a hardship they don't really address uh, in the sense of like, they address it in what she goes for when she like starts getting more powerful. Mm-hmm. But in the terms of how the other girls view her or treat her like behavior, they definitely don't view it as a, as an issue, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess. Um, and she's had a hard time. Like she's been through something with Chris before where he's treated her badly, which again gets skirted, like kind of glossed over a little bit, like as far as something she's been through. And mm-hmm. why she might be so angry or whatever. Um, but she's amazing. She's the leader. She's a natural leader. She's naturally in charge. She's mean to everybody, which is actually something they say in it. Like, Nancy's mean to everyone. And it's like, yeah, she is. To be fair, <laughs> she's mean all the time. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's just a personality. Yeah. Um, she, she's cool. She's just really cool and wants to be powerful. And because she's been so downtrodden i think is because is why she gets so drunk on the power Mm -hmm. um later on and then there's rochelle and um bonnie Bonnie? yeah Mm -hmm. rochelle and bonnie who are played by um rachel is it rachel true rachel true and neve campbell and um they don't even have last names in the when you look at the cast list they don't have last names oh they do it's bonnie harper and rochelle zimmerman on like the cast list i was like are they just like nameless <laughs> they're like and you know bonnie and rochelle they're also definitely the the sidekicks to the main yeah. um tension between sarah and nancy who are kind of the most independent fully formed yeah. witches so what's interesting is they definitely need one or the other mm-hmm. to have any semblance of power um and honestly i do think they get like a bad rap because they are just followers really mm-hmm. and they do stuff which in the grand scheme of things is you is completely understandable i don't think it could be viewed as abusing their power the stuff they use their magic for mm-hmm. um and they kind of get lumped in with nancy it's like but nancy's clearly like quite terrifying at this point and more powerful than them mm-hmm. so um but yeah um neve campbell is like she has scar like scarring on her back from I don't think do they tell us what the scarring is for. I don't think so. From I mean, where it comes from. No, we are so, I mean, it's it's kind of from it like a, a fire. fire. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's curious that like we don't really get same as with Nancy. We don't really get excessive information about the stuff right. that the reason as to why they're kind of downtrodden. We just get the glimpses of the situation as it is when we yeah. meet them um but they don't expand on it but it does like clearly inform the characters and their personalities yeah 
So Neve Campbell, like she's obviously like very aware of her body, very, very scared of anyone seeing her scarring, very self conscious mm-hmm. about it. And as a teen girl, you can imagine like like having basic like spots is like bad enough. Like mm-hmm. having massive scarring on your back, especially when you live in LA, like you can only imagine how bad it would be. So that's like her whole person. She's like quite quiet. She's sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, unsure of herself and self conscious and all that stuff. And Bonnie is different because Bonnie is like nice. And knows who she is, is good at stuff. She's an excellent swimmer and diver and all this stuff. But is actually like just Oh, being, that's Rochelle. Like, raci- oh, Rochelle, sorry. Yeah, not funny. And, um, but is being like racially, like, is facing racist abuse like every single day. Yeah. <laughs> Which again is treated kind of the same as everyone else. I'm like, um, guys, <laughs> like this is like a real, like, I don't know. This is not like something that's just like, oh, you know, what can you do? It's like, shit, that position I find myself in. It's like, no, no, this could be dealt with. <laughs> like, this is bad. Um, and it's just, like, consist- like constant and, like, just really awful that she's just literally faces this all the time. And, but otherwise, she's fine. She's like, and so you feel like her, her out, her outsiderness, this comes from, like, outsiderness. Um, it comes from, um, just literally her being a black girl. Um, which again is not really, it's just kind of there. It's like, there's one girl who's incredibly racist to her, but this one girl can't inform her entire experience. So it feels like there's other people that kind of let it happen or don't say anything. Or that's another reason she's ostracized um, and why she's fallen in with this particular group. But yeah, again, she just kind of, even though she has her own things and she's like a perfectly like nice girl for mm-hmm. the most part, she doesn't really have much agency she is kind of like this like i said she her and bonnie they both follow whoever's more powerful at the moment mm-hmm. within their little group um but i will say yes they're followers but they're all still like they all still stick together they're not followers in the sense that they would go outside of this group they still found their mm-hmm. people and they follow this like nancy or or sarah because they still they believe that they're their people do you mean that they're the people they still want to be around so in some ways it's still they're still confident enough to not follow any other crowd or not to distance themselves when it gets a bit awkward or whatever it's like no they're they're very much there for each other so there's also that and also even towards the end like without you know just to skip very briefly ahead mm. even after everything goes down and kind of sarah and and nancy uh, and the whole kind of quartet gets broken up bonnie and rochelle still stick together by themselves mm. without sarah without nancy so they are they are friends and i think they are like the dynamic between them is quite interesting because they're i kind of assume that they just band together because they are ostracized in different ways or because mm. of like this you know, interest in in taking power or earning power through a different way because high school has othered them in in completely kind of different ways. But still, so they band together because it's it makes it it makes the high school experience for them a little bit more palatable if they share it together. And you know, if one of them gets picked at, then the other ones are gonna close by. So it's sort yeah. of a support system by necessity. I don't really know if they would be friends if they weren't kind of othered by the high school? That's a good, that's a good question. But I mean, I, I mean, I can kind of say, but then I feel like it, 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 it's the same with in high school. It's like, well, why is anyone friends with anyone? Mm-hmm. Is it not because of the class you happen to be put in or yes. the team you happen to join? Or it's like, no one's really making, you're like confined in this, like with limited people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, well, you're kind of being forced into making, if you're going to make friends, then it's not necessarily because you've, you've got to like have a taste of everybody mm-hmm. and you've decided, like actually made a decision. It's like, well, it's just who you end up having the most in common with in this particular moment and sometimes not even that it just ends up with who you I don't know you might be one thing in common like I don't know so it's just um it's it's because like in high school you're not allowed to be friends with multiple different groups of people like it's exactly. so it will then get parodied in teen movies at nauseam right like in Mean Girls and, and yeah. everything subsequently or even like very early on in Heathers which we talked about on the podcast a few weeks back 
you are literally divided by tables. The the kind of the cafeteria scene is a classic in old teen movies where they go around and they kind of explain to the newcomer what the social strata is in that particular high school. And if you get kind of banded with the weirdos, then you're one of the weirdos. If you're one of the nerds, you're one of the nerds. You don't get to have a weird friend and a nerdy friend and a popular jock friend and, mm-hmm. and kind of, you know, have people who you just like who also have different lives and maybe don't have everything in common with you. And it's interesting because we see that with Sarah. Like when she comes in, like you said, she has everything to just be one of the kind of cool popular girls instantly. But the minute mm. she goes out with Chris Hooker and then like he spreads rumors about her, she gets ostracized in the same way as the other girls. So she kind of goes to them. She kind of bands together with them closer because of that. Yeah. Yeah. But so that, yeah, that ties her into them um, in a more solid way. Cause it, at the mm. beginning it feels like she's kind of on the fence. Yes. But I will say like, all the hangouts pre them summoning the big power, mm-hmm. all the hangouts seem genuine. They're genuinely having a nice time together. They yeah. genuinely care about each other. Um, you know, they seem to, you know, want good things for each other. And genuinely those scenes of them at like sleep over at each other's houses and stuff seem great, seem mm-hmm. fun, seem nice. They're all having a good time. The chat's easy. They're very comfortable around each other. So I also do feel like they felt, feel like, it looks like they feel like they found their tribe when they're when it, and it's just the three of them like nancy um bonnie and rochelle when it was just the three of them was one thing but finding their fourth and knowing that sarah it really is their fourth because it mel- melds their group in a way that i think didn't exist before mm-hmm. it makes them a whole and um i really love that because they weren't wrong they mm-hmm. weren't wrong that sarah's their fourth it just all got out of hand um yeah and, and what do you think because they make Sarah their fourth because Bonnie sees kind of her display natural magical powers, right? And mm. I think this is a thing that also sets her apart and pits her against Nancy's because Nancy, you know, we're we're shown that she's so committed to the to the magic, to the witchcraft. Like she's studying, you know, it's it's her whole aesthetic. It's the thing that she's obsessed with. She's like more into it, I think, than Rochelle and and Bonnie. And Sarah just kind of can do it. She's born with it. Which already makes Nancy a little bit jealous, I think. There's always a little bit of jealousy there in that dynamic. But she completes the group and their their abilities really grow because of that. But what do you think about the way that all their rituals, the witchcraft, all of that is is shown in the film? Because this is the thing that I think, as any teenage girl, when we saw this film, I got absolutely obsessed with this. I was like, oh my god, we can all be witches. Yeah, I think I love that they keep the rituals quite simple. Like, I think there could have been a real temptation to go like, and then you have to sacrifice a chicken or whatever. And it's all just about their energy matching up. And I love the way they do that when they when they're like casting or enchanting or whatever, Mm -hmm. how it just kind of is this build up of whispers and you just hear when they sink. And it, when it changes, and I'm mm-hmm. like, I love this as an idea of magic, of that there's not really much you need apart from to commit and to all be on the same wavelength, um, which made it seem possible <laughs> as a teenager. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're like, oh, we could do this. <laughs> I don't really need anything special. I need some like flowers and like, I don't know, just to like close my eyes and chant for long enough with my friends. Um which was exciting and it was such a clever way to do it because it's like no you don't need some big Mm -hmm. extra thing that you need to go find or like whatever you don't need to find some big gemstone or Mm. have the blood of a virgin or whatever the fuck it's just like no you just need to find your people and be in enough sync with them and channel all your power and that's it and then you can do things um and I, like, I loved it. I was like, I, did, I can't tell you the amount of times me and my friends <laughs> have tried <laughs> to do stuff. And we're just, like, doing, like, the whisper casting. Like, <laughs> trying to, like... Because you're, you're like, right. Especially, like, for boys and stuff. Because <laughs> you're right. Because in the film, like, there is no, there is no otherworldly thing. There is no quest. It's just, like, you no. need to believe 
very intensely and kind of these rituals and stuff they kind of adapt them as they go along right and yeah. there's big truths like the one that lirio the the woman in the in the magic shop kind of tells them about repercussions and about stuff coming back threefold and all that stuff there's like vague you know natural rules to the witchcraft that they practice but it does feel very organic and very organic to them specifically yeah and i, I think that was like a really clever wrote to take it down in the sense of like and even the magic some of the magic they do like some of the glamours and stuff mm -hmm. is just like yeah it's just kind of I mean obviously it's at like in the film it's actual magic but it kind of feels like misdirection or like you know it kind of feels a bit what Darren Brown does <laughs> 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 well you're like this doesn't feel so far <laughs> from him doing his like freaky little shows where I'm like, I don't understand what's happened or how this is, why it's in my brain or how he's done this. But like, do you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. it, it all feels quite like, it doesn't feel so big. Like obviously there's lightning and thunder and all that stuff, mm. but that feels like a more connection to the elements than anything else rather than them making magic in that way. Um, the actual magic they do doesn't feel so big that you're like, oh, they can just like, I don't know blow stuff up or whatever the fuck and there's emotions attached to it and there's like I don't know like some of the stuff they do by accident because they're emotional and mm -hmm. um I love that about it I love that it's connected to that just inherently like you said connected to who they are as a person to them naturally mm -hmm. um rather than it just being like oh I can do this and this now with my little wand or whatever I can like point at something and do this it's like not like that um and and how yeah, I mean, do you think that. and how do you think that they the characters change after they get what they want because it's it's very different from for everyone sarah mm -hmm. wants chris to fall in love with her to want her bonnie who's the saddest i think character just wants to be beautiful so her scars disappear uh mm -hmm. rochelle wants revenge on her racist bully who loses all her hair and fuck her um and nancy's the nancy wants all the power she wants all the power of manon so but mm -hmm. this affects them all very differently so how do you think that they all change after they get what they want well, I per first of all, <laughs> I want to state very clearly that I'm on all their sides. I think they're all right. Um, yes, I'm like they've they've all they're all correct. <laughs> I yes. agree with all of them. <laughs> but like, and it's they're teenage girls. It's completely the stuff they want is completely understandable. Mm -hmm. Um, and to be fair, it's honestly not. It's surprising it wasn't more. It wasn't bigger stuff. It wasn't like more insane or like several things all at once they seem quite happy with the quite simple things like the one thing they've wanted for a long time mm -hmm. i was like they're not like i mean i know nancy goes overboard but like the rest of them don't even feel like they're being really greedy it's like oh they just wanted this one thing and then mm -hmm. they want to be like and then they want to live a normal teenage life which isn't even like none of them are trying to be famous or like i don't know it's like really it's actually quite measured so um bonnie Losing your scars, like something like that is, com again, like completely understandable. It, you know, she's she's willing to go through all kinds of pain. Like you see one of the treatments are so painful she's going through to try and even just lessen them. And it's like, and she comes in wearing like a vest top and everyone's like, oh, and I'm like, literally, <laughs> imagine, imagine you have all this power and all she wants to do is like wear a vest top and have like boys look at her. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's actually just like, it's, it's completely understandable. And I'm totally on her side about that. And I'm like, that she's not even trying to do anything else. Like, this is mm -hmm. it for her. This is like the epitome of everything she could ever hope for happen happening. And with Rochelle, I don't think she went far enough <laughs> with the racist bully. <laughs> I'm like, really? This is it? Because. <laughs> She even shows her a little bit of sympathy when she yeah. finds her in the shower. And I'm like, no, make it worse. She, she feels bad. And I'm like, you did not even go far enough. Mm. Like, honestly, like, because that, that was like, and that's always a bit of a weird sticking point mm -hmm. in that story for me where I'm just like, we're really making this racist girl seem like actually she's not that bad. Like it was like normal bullying or like, like bullying. It's like, no, it was awful. And they really take the angle of like, oh, but you know, isn't it bad that she went too far? And it's like, no, no, no that wasn't far enough. <laughs> You've taken racism as like a very like, just like a minuscule thing, which it isn't. So um, 
that's always one that like a kind of like sticks kind of just like mm, that's not enough for me mm-hmm. she should have also died just, like just saying um and when and, and when they get like their their powers uh when they have like again in the ending when they have that like mini fantasy or like projection by sarah where they get mm. the punishment that they had doled oh. out kind of got back to them so like rochelle is shown losing her hair and bonnie shown covered in scars i'm a little bit like like what you said they weren't actually no. like they weren't actually hurting anyone that didn't deserve it you know what i mean like yeah bonnie definitely wasn't doing anything terrible and she just wanted to feel good in her own skin and not feel you know so yeah. um bad about the scarring that she had and Rochelle should have gone fucking harder on that terrible racist. Like, fuck that bitch. Yeah. And it's like that thing of like, it's like, oh, back time story. It's like, I think when you put something out of balance, I don't think Bonnie losing her scarring and a racist being bald is like going to tip the balance in nature like enough that anyone's going to be like, you need to serve to be punished. Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, in the grand scheme of, we're talking about the balance of na- nature, mm-hmm. which is what they're talking about, right? Like, yeah. When she's talking about the big, when the woman in the shop is talking about the powers and how there's dark and light and all of it, which you, so you can't say that anything's completely light, white magic or like dark mm-hmm, magic, or whatever mm-hmm. the fuck. It's all balance. It's like, I don't think anything they were doing was really tipping the balance in a way that would be like nature or like the powers that be are going to be like, no, <laughs> like this is how dare you take away your scars, Bonnie? How dare you have a not? It's like, I don't think that's what their concern is, to be honest. Um, and even even the initial thing that happens with um with Nancy is unintentional. Even the, like Nancy, the thing the thing about her and her mum getting money is is accidental. That's what, she doesn't even mean really to do that, right? Like mm-hmm. so she 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 punishes the guy that has who's awful again who's awful, um like because she's angry because he's like abusive to her mum. Mm-hmm. and they, it's like well that's fair that she's angry about this and her powers have done something which means they get this money but it wasn't even really like a plan it was it just happened and i had to look it up because i get one hundred and seventy five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and then they like buy this apartment and i was like wait <laughs> a second how much money is that so i looked up and i was like oh no legit they like, could have bought an apartment <laughs> in la in 96 <laughs> for that money and her money left over and i was like wow <laughs> I because mean, I feel like if this ha- if it happened now, you'd be like, great. <laughs> yeah, I can get like maybe put down a deposit for a flat. Yeah, like maybe, <laughs> and have le- le- leftovers enough to like get a, a delivery or something. That's it. Wait, are you saying that this goes to us? Five to you. Hundred and seventy five. What a dear sweet man. love the way they do that story right so even that they get all this money it's unexpected they genuinely need it and it's genuinely a good thing for them but even when they move in there's like nothing on the walls it's just like kind of random stuff dotted around an empty <laughs> like apartment and i love it. it's like yeah they don't know how to live like this actually like it's lit there's like a jukebox and like a couch <laughs> <laughs> like it's nothing like, else. it's like the image i actually think it's really it's really sweet and kind of good um yeah. production design because it's like this is what these this mom and her daughter who have been sort of kind of downtrodden and living near poverty that's what they imagine luxury is and that's luxury for them like just this bare space you know just having the space and even like nancy having her own room where she can close the Mm. door and fit all her friends and it feels so bare compared to their trailer and and i think that's like very deliberate it's like let's go the opposite direction something really high up something really spacious and kind of like completely empty with this one with these like two extravagant like silly items of luxury like that fucking jukebox that plays only one artist and that weird 
art, like modern art esque type couch. I was like, that looks so uncomfortable. But you know what? If it makes you happy, good for you. I love, but I, I, I like, yeah, I like that it was incorporated in. Like, yeah, if you suddenly get money, mm-hmm. you, you're not just like, oh, I'm gonna now move into my perfectly decorated and like house um, with all the things. I, I don't know. It's just like, yeah, and also. The other thing about a bigger space is like it actually takes you a lot of time to fill it. Um, like I was in, I'm just going to casually drop that I was in a castle this year mm. and um, visiting a friend that I know who lives in a castle because, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know. I know. I know. It's all, it's all we, a thing. We can offline. Anyway, we can offline there. that. <laughs> we can. <laughs> but like, so I was at this castle in France and the thought I had was like, you have to have. The, the reason there are suits of armor and like just the most random shit you ever like massive art pieces because you have to fill that space it just looks really weird <laughs> if mm-hmm. you don't and i was like what's actually going to cost you like a lot of money and time is actually going i just have to like constantly walk around like looking for things to fill the space otherwise it's not going to look lived in or cozy or empty um, or, or like full and um i think that about like when people move in somewhere it's just like yeah it's actually like accumulating all the stuff that makes it feel like this is actually like a, a huge ordeal um like having a massive house is like one thing but like to make it feel like home and to do all it's like takes so much time and effort and i'm like mm-hmm. it's actually a lot um but yeah so i i love that they did that too it's like well they don't have what are they gonna you can't really hang things on the wall in the trailer mm-hmm. so they don't have like pic like posters or pictures or even like do you know what I mean it's just like mm-hmm. and all that stuff will take all this time to accumulate so I love that it didn't do it where it was just like oh here's a perfectly decorated full place mm-hmm. that they've got and also I love that this idea because I think often what happens as well when you have like a poor family in a film who comes into money they buy all this gaudy stuff and they're just kind of assholes about it and mm-hmm. like and it's like no that the first thing she did was buy summer for her and her daughter to live. Mm-hmm. That was decent, which is an incredibly sensible thing to do with like a windfall of cash. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing she did. She's a, she's not a bad mother. Mm-hmm. She was in a bad situation. And I like that they made it like that. It's like, mm-hmm. she's not bad. Um, um, but yeah, I do. I still think it's glossed over. Like being in that trailer with the guy she was seeing, I said, this, I, her life was not good. Like Nancy's life was not, yeah. okay and there's a lot of reasons nancy had to be as angry as she was yeah. um and it's um and i kind of yeah. want to i kind of want to talk about nancy in depth because i think i think she's the most she's not just the kind of the most visually iconic character because she's got this like mm. image of what well this film created the image of what a, a witch in the 90s and beyond would look like like people are still imitating mm. that look the the aesthetics of nancy in particular in this film have influenced every single witch property that ever was after the craft but nancy also kind of becomes the villain and she's positioned kind of as a villain from the beginning but i think she's very misunderstood as a character because we get so much kind of light touch background info and we see a glimpse of her situation and like you say she's not in a good place of course she's fucking angry and she's so angry and so disempowered that she you can understand why she gravitate towards witchcraft she why she gravitate towards something that potentially can empower her even supernaturally Mm. and then when stuff kind of starts happening she kind of gorges on it like she gets drunk on the power because she probably never had it like she never had the ability to to walk into a room and know that she is the most powerful person in the room. Even when we see them kind of walking down the high school and people are kind of partying around her and people yell stuff at her and she's insulted. Like she doesn't let it get to her, but I don't think anyone can really not let that consistent uh, name calling and bullshit not get to them even a little bit, especially not when it's that consistent and that constant. So when she then kind of goes into that party to take revenge on Chris, it's a completely dif- different vibe. Like she goes in knowing that she's the most powerful bitch in that room. And even though she ends up kind of villainized, I always really got it. I was like, she's she's angry, but she's angry for reasons. Yeah. And she's obviously had to develop an armor, right? Mm-hmm. That's what you can tell about Nancy. So whatever happened with Chris and her before, well, she says she says to Sarah, he did the same thing to me when he told everyone 
about her and whatever, about them two getting together or whatever. And it's like, so we didn't see that. And we've seen how bad it is for Sarah. And Sarah is probably someone who could get through it because she looks the way she does and she is who she is, right? So eventually, maybe her her like high school life wouldn't have ended up like as bad as Nancy's. But I'm like for Nancy, she's already like, people up in school, you know how kids can be like, they know you live in a trailer. Um, and then this guy, this popular guy spreading rumors about you, probably because mm-hmm. dis- you weren't probably one of the popular girls before anyway, is now distanced himself and also making you out to seem really bad and calling you a slut and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, she's had to develop an armor. She's had to be start being mean to everyone. She's had to make people scared of her to a certain extent because they're not going to fully leave her alone but they're never really going to fuck with her either um they'll say stuff but they're not actually trying to like mess with her because yeah she's had to make herself a scary person and i like i think again that gets and i was like i feel like there's room there would if there's an extended film or like a series or something Mm -hmm. i feel like there'd be room for nancy to have like a really good arc as a character because it's not that she doesn't deserve the magic. It's like what you said. She's a teenage girl who suddenly got power when she never had, had had any before. And I don't know. There's a really good... She's obviously a natural talent at it. And I would love to see the arc where she like learns to control it. I also... I really want her to be nice. I would just love to see her like learn to control what she has and stuff. Because I'm just like, yeah, she does have reasons. She has reasons to be mad. And it, it does always make me a bit sad that she ends up where she does. Because mm-hmm. um, I'm like, I, I don't know if she deserved it. Not really. She went off the deep end for sure. But I'm just like, I would love to like have something to have pulled her back. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she deserved to be pulled back. Yeah. And deserve like a second chance and not to just mm. be punished by everyone around her. And I wonder if this is a good place as well to talk about the one key male character in the craft (laughs) i always want to talk to you about these films but i particularly want to hear you viscerate (laughs) chris hooker as played by skeet ulrich chris flipping hooker (laughs) well first of all this actor just had like a career in the 90s just running around terrorizing teenage girls um worst boyfriend of the 90s yeah just absolute dab hand at that role just just effortless but um he is that little that little (laughs) that little fuck so basically (laughs) what is his deal and the worst okay so he's attractive like girls find him attractive right he's attractive girls want to date him so it's not even that he's not getting the girls he's some little incel prick he's literally could get the girls because he has no foresight or no patience to just like actually date someone and be nice for like longer than five seconds he is like well i kissed you on this date and then you didn't sleep with me so i'm just gonna be a dick about it and tell everyone at school that you did it anyway it's like what is happening in your tiny little like fuck brain and he's got friends as well who are awful but like it's just i don't know like the mindset of someone who does that of a teenage boy and what's actually so disgusting about it i was like imagine this in high school Mm-hmm. You're at school. Like, your whole world centers around this one place you have to come every day with these people. And he's running around being an absolute asshole for no reason. Um, and again, like, when people are like, oh, when they all get a bit like, oh, someone's dead, it's like, yeah, but okay. But it was, Chris died. I mean, do we, are we upset? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if we're upset about this. It's like, someone died. Chris died. Let's be specific. Um, He wasn't, (laughs) like, some innocent. (laughs) Like, I mean, is the world worse, like, because Chris is gone? Probably not. Um, He was just, like, and how many other girls? So we know about Nancy and we know about Sarah. How Mm. many other girls did he do this to? And I would also love a timeline where all more women in the school just get together (laughs) And the whole film's just about punishing Chris. Um, because yeah, I don't it's just it's just the idea of a high school boy running around and this is before, this is the nineties. No one even has a mobile fucking phone, right? <laughs> this is not do you understand the effort involved in spreading that <laughs> around? You can't just send one DM or like tweet it out or like fucking send him one text message oh like he was like on the phone to people like some little bitch like some little like little <laughs> i'm so mad but like he like put effort into like to tell people this and spread it and like to 
even do and knowing what it did to like spread these rumors and to know that he'd be unscathed he like knows he'll be unscathed and the way he talks to sarah when she confronts him Mm -hmm. just i don't know how no one murdered him in that in that moment (laughs) like i I don't know (laughs) how she didn't go into a blind rage and just attack him because i was like i would be in attack mode and like nancy's reaction because of her experience and what he does to sarah i'm like Mm -hmm. completely justified i would also be leaving the house in like i don't know with like steam coming out my ears like ready to like fully commit murder um but also it's the shit it's the fact that also like he he's rejected but not like in a in a terrible Mm -hmm. way not in a like a humiliating way and then he spreads the rumors about her like slut shaming her and rejects her but i'm like my dude, but what what do you get out of this? This is what makes exactly. him so fucking evil. It's like, dude, if all you wanted to do was get laid and then slot shame her or, you know, reject her or whatever, you're not even getting that. What exactly. are you getting out of it? Like, what a sadistic little motherfucker that all he wants to do is slot shame this girl who didn't even sleep with him. It's like, yeah. you have categorically closed the door on her ever, ever sleeping with you. The fact that Sarah, like, gets this crush on him is, like, you know, teenage girls, hormones, problematic crushes, all of that. We can can relate. But this little bitch, Chris Hooker, just wants to humiliate her. But I'm also like, what are you humiliating for? Like, she she didn't actually sleep with you. And, like, why would it be... Why would it be humiliating for her? I mean, like, the whole politics of slut shaming is just ridiculous. Like, they make absolutely no sense. It's like, I'm sorry, you're the guy who's consistently slut shamed different girls in the school and yet you're not the slutty one well, they are because nancy correctly calls him a slut as well. i was like yeah mm-hmm. he is a little slut and it's like how yeah exactly how is it shameful them to have slept with you do you understand what you're saying you're saying it's embarrassing for this girl that she slept with you like what exactly. where is the logic exactly where is the logic in it with these little greasy curtains oh. and i <laughs> no no he's got, he's got the greasy curtains and scream here he's got that weird oh. little curly cut hair i prefer him with the oh, greasy does he cu- have curly hair i'm yeah. just amalgamating his characters i'm like this little <laughs> and like he's just the same this is just him a couple of years later in scream <laughs> i just like th- they actually came out in the same year Oh shit, it's him a few months later. Yeah. Oh my god. So the I like, you know, bless Skeet Ulrich. By all accounts, he's a lovely man and he is aged like a fine wine. But oh, yes. as we both know, because we have unfortunately for both of us watched yes. all of Riverdale. But yes. um <laughs> he like he's so good at playing this like skeezy boyfriend or like teenage boy who can move so effortlessly between charming and deeply deeply hurtful in yeah. this like weaponizing the politics of teenagers the teenagers in the 90s as well and just like pressuring girls into sex but then turning it on them in this weird yeah. nonsensical fucked up way and like let me just say like yes yeah there's nothing wrong with being slutty and of course like the the politics but the politics of high school and around sexuality and, and like teenagers and teenage girls in particular it's like the girl is always the the, the girl is always going to be blamed here yeah and the fact Always. that he just keeps going to this, like, you know, he calls Nancy a major slut. I was like, we never see Nancy even, even interested around. in anyone. Yeah, exactly. Like, she sleeps with Chris um, pretending to be Sarah to get back at him. And, you know, that's, like, fucked up in its own in its own right. But at this point, like, Nancy is fully, is fully the villain. Although she does do that to get back, uh, to get back at him for taking advantage of her friend, for trying to assault Sarah. Yeah. So I, this is the thing. It's like, I'm so I, did, mad. I just said, it, well, I know. I did say it was like, it's, but it's, he's like the perfect example of a guy who just hates women, wants to sleep with women, but hates them. Mm-hmm. Because why else would you be doing stuff like that? You hate all the girls around you. You don't actually like any of them. He's, he never liked Sarah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. you couldn't have ever liked her to immediately to turn around and that immediately be a response mm-hmm. to her not sleeping with you. Um, and he thinks he should be able to sleep with girls like Sarah, but then has slept with, because he says he has actually slept with Nancy, because Nancy's like he spreads disease, I know from experience, mm-hmm. which makes it, and like, and it's, they talk like they have slept together in the past. So can't, but thinks he can do better than girls like, than Nancy, like, than, like, do better than girls mm-hmm. like Nancy. So he's always angry 
that even if he is sleep- be sleeping with a girl, it's a wrong girl, so he treats her badly. Mm-hmm. And when he's not sleeping with a girl who he thinks he should be able to, he treats her badly because she doesn't want to, like, and not even, like, doesn't want to in the long run, doesn't want to immediately. Like, literally, that's the issue. It's not even like he has a girlfriend, and not that that would be better, but it's not like, oh, well, we've been together for this amount of time, and I want this. It's like, you just, you're mad that this girl hasn't slept with you, like, immediately. Yeah. Um, why should she? What, why, why? What, what I don't know. And even, yes, I, I, like, people have talked about this scene, right, where she pretends to be, but I'm like, well, she's punishing him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, it wasn't just to get what she wanted. It was, it was purposely to punish him. And like, that's what she was doing it for. And it is a punishment. And, um, I do think, yeah, he, and he is under the spell, right? That Sarah's cast on him mm-hmm. when he tries to assault Sarah. Error. but i'm like i don't the way they've the way what's been really clever about this film is that the way they portray magic is that you're not doing anything that's not in you already mm-hmm. if you see me mm-hmm. like it doesn't feel like you can make someone act like not themselves and the way he behaved this whole film what we know about him already is like he's not above this yes he's obsessed with sarah specifically mm-hmm. because of the spell but he's not above doing what he did to her mm-hmm. in in without with a spell or without it yeah. Like he was clearly on this path anyway because look at like look at who he, he was before. Um Yeah, but you're absolutely you're absolutely right. Because like if we look at the at the magic sort of um amplifying what they are, both kind of in the positive and the negative, like mm. you know, they, they take away like, you know, they, they make they take away Bonnie's scars, they um take away kind of um Rochelle's bully, although Rochelle's case is kind of a little bit weird because she doesn't actually get anything for herself she just like no. stops the bully and and nancy get all this pa- gets all this power and sarah gets chris so they're kind of amplified right but when chris mm. is under the spell in a similar way to nancy the stuff that was already there is the stuff that gets amplified so kind of his ba- very very basic self-control is erased but like he was 100 percent on the track line to to assault a girl or a woman down the line like uh, that kind of spell just expedited it just made it happen quicker and he 100% doesn't really fucking understand what it is that he did wrong and I I don't think that has anything to do with the spell itself no he didn't understand what he didn't care about what he did to anyone before that but anyway his little his little cheerleaders little friends who I'm sure never get any girls. So it's just like living vicariously through him and also hating women along with him and like rejoicing every time he humili- humiliates a new girl. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what kind of life are you living? Why are you even popular? You're just that kind of like what we see in a lot of teen movies, that classic kind of who's probably going to like be a deadbeat at some point, you know, mm-hmm. like is just not happy with themselves, is never going to be satisfied with whatever they get. It's just like, uh, he's gross, just absolutely the grossest point and they do it really in a clever way that doesn't make him this uber villain he's not smart Mm -hmm. he's not you know this mastermind he's just he's an idiot and he's gross and he's unkind and spiteful and ruthless and it's like yeah he's he's just what like the worst like the worst um I don't know. What am I trying to say? I don't know. <laughs> that like what well, teenage boy where everyone like dreads a teenage boy being, mm-hmm. right? Worst manifestation of a teenage boy. Yes. Right? All the things you'd be scared about a teenage boy doing, he's that. And it doesn't even feel exaggerated or out of place or yeah, but it, it feels real. And I'm like, because unfortunately we know that this person isn't not like is not far from reality at all. Um but yeah, but mostly I'm pissed about the effort it would have taken to spread rumors like that around an entire <laughs> fucking high school in LA because no one was like, what did he like page everyone? Like, what the fuck? Like, how did he, what, <laughs> how did he even get that? In? Did he like make a newsletter? Like, what did he do? Like, is literally. <laughs> the practicalities like, you, of slut shaming are the thing like, that pisses you off the most. <laughs> in the 90s, I didn't know information like that from like, it's like, that's effort. That took effort. And like, he's running around, like he's acting like he's so chill. He's running around like a little bitch spreading little rumors like whispering to his little friends because i'm like how did he do this um it just drives me like i'm like up the wall i'm like what again i would like to see i would love to see him like 
like <laughs> Sarah not sleeping with him, and then him making the little decision, and then how did he even start it? <laughs> and then walking around being like, yeah, yeah, something like that. Like it's like you pathetic little like. I would like to film it and then show it to him and be like, watch, watch yourself, <laughs> watch yourself doing this, going around your school. Do you not have? Do you not have classes? You're probably failing or whatever to like concentrate <laughs> on. What are you doing? Like, why is this your life? Where are your parents? Like. Oh, just absolutely. They should have made his thing drop off. Like, honestly, I every time I watch it, I'm like, no one was harsh enough <laughs> to anybody. <laughs> like, and the, again, the punishment he got initially before he, like, died, before he paid mm-hmm. the ultimate price, for, like, again, not too sad about it, but, like, um, before he did that, I was like, the punishment he got was just being nice mm-hmm. to Sarah. And I'm like, as far as punishments go... Like, he was mildly, his friends find it mildly embarrassing, but he wasn't embarrassed because he was in this spell. Yeah. So I'm just like, it wasn't even really a punishment. He was just, like, vaguely nice to a girl. <laughs> like, and I'm like, listen, they could have gone much further. We're talking about these girls, like, being powerful. It's like, they had so, they already had quite a bit of restraint, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I'm like, if I was a teen and I was going for revenge on someone and I had, like, magical powers, Mm-hmm. All kinds of things have been falling off of him. I don't know. Like, it would have been horrendous. I also do love how we gloss over the guy getting run over at the beginning. Everyone forgets him. Yes. <laughs> As someone who dies. <laughs> but, like, a guy gets, like, fully, fully run over for being a bit weird <laughs> in the street. Like, so early on. <laughs> the snake guy. And I'm just like, they were, they did not, they had no feelings about that. They're like, oh my God, whoa, we made that happen. <laughs> anyway. No, that's, that's kind of one of the, the little jump scares of the film that you kind of completely forget about because, you know, it's just some, <laughs> some, some, some dude on the street with a snake. <laughs> they really don't ever think about it again. <laughs> but I did really want to talk about that scene with, um, with Chris and Nancy pretending to be Sarah mm. and Nancy killing Chris. Cause this is probably like a, a the most like problematic scene on mm. so many levels. And also the, um, the first, aside from the guy who gets run over in the street, the first kind of <laughs> full horror scene, especially because mm. this is where Nancy goes full horror beast like she goes fully unhinged and starts yelling and there's so much anger and she's like floating and i love one of my favorite shots of the entire film is her the tips of her boots scraping the floor as she glides towards him yelling and and eventually like magically pushes him out the window this is the moment where she gets real and when sarah kind of decides that she needs to not just cut ties with them but also like stop them from having the powers um Mm. take the powers away from them so what do you make about that that as the turning point of the whole film um like i get why for sarah and stuff it was scary but like you know someone your age dying Mm -hmm. that you feel would feel partly responsible i don't think sarah takes enough responsibility um for it because like well the powers that you all have are because of all of you um and I do think that, like, as in, like, they they all act like Nancy's, like, and say, it's like, well, I don't think, you know Nancy, right? She left in a rage to go find him. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was that implausible that she was going to do something like this. And I think it was incredibly naive of them to think it wasn't going to be this explosive, especially because of her history with Chris. Mm-hmm. Um but I do get that, like, someone, you're a teen boy that you were romantically involved with dying would be enough to be like, okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> this is not fun anymore. Because, you know, I think Sarah, especially, her her main thing seems to be kind of just having fun. Mm-hmm. She doesn't have any major things that she wants. Like, she doesn't really, apart from, like, kind of semi-punishing Chris a little bit and wanting him to like her, but then like it all going away she doesn't really want anything else she doesn't try and get anything for us she's just like you know she's the one who does the tricks so like her eyes like her eye color changing her eye color changing her hair color mm-hmm. um she's she's more interested in like having it but not really doing huge things with it mm-hmm. so i could see where that would be too far for her and i think i think this is the point where there should have been, rather than just trying to bind Nancy, there should have been an attempt to, like, 
reach out for her like rather than disconnecting from her i feel like this should have been the point for like a reaching out or pulling back of her Mm -hmm. um because again like we said nancy had lots of reasons to be angry and it wasn't handled well (laughs) yeah like but um it's not like that either of them any any of them ever talking to her about it Mm -hmm. or dealing with it or trying to understand or or anything like that she's angry and then all they try and do is make her feel bad for being angry Mm. which just spurs her on which i guess is actually the most weirdly logical thing for teenage girls to do and really the way that i think collectively we deal with with female anger and with particularly with like teenage girls is anger that's a weird sentence but like particularly with the anger of teenage girls Mm. um because it is Like, totally, completely, people would blame Nancy for being angry. They would make her into the villain. And and I think one of the criticisms of the film is that they make Nancy into the villain and the girls turn on themselves. But I think that rings really, really true. Very often in the dynamics between, like, friendships, especially between young women. And at this age, like, they're not, they're not going to have the emotional capacity to have conversations that are difficult and try to empathize with nancy and obviously this is like supernatural and and a horror movie and all of that but that just makes it bigger that just makes it more high stakes but the the kind of the emotional immaturity is still there of course they're going to try to solve everything individually instead of just fucking having a conversation but you know what if they were to just have a conversation that would not make such a good teen horror film (laughs) as we saw in the craft legacy but i don't even think it's that i think it's more just like when Nancy storms out, I think it's like, yeah, she did, but to, to immediately be like, oh no, Nancy's gone off the rails. Like, first of all, she's fucking badass and she did it because he hurt you. But also, and like Sarah really lets herself off the hook. I think Sarah says a line that's something like, yeah, I know I did the original spell, but I never want him dead. It's like, okay, but you did also put a spell on him. Mm-hmm. And it's just that thing of like, it can't all be Nancy's fault. Like, and I th- it feels like that thing of like, because you've all been connected, mm-hmm. right? That's the whole, the whole thing. The only reason you're all this powerful, the only reason Nancy's so powerful is because of the connection she has with all the three of these other girls. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, I, I just wish they, I don't know. I wanted them to be more together, but I get, you're right. Like it would have been less days <laughs> if they're all just like, Nancy, that was bad. But anyway, let's just keep doing magic. Um, <laughs> and- and and what do you make about the Nancy's ending? Especially kind of I... after that big like showdown at Sarah's house and the way that she ends up in um kind of confined in a psychiatric hospital. Well, I'm really curious about that. So I'm curious about if Sarah didn't immediately try and bind Nancy, right, to stop her using her powers, mm-hmm. would they have gone on the attack if she had just distanced herself? Um, I don't know. But she does try to buy Nancy, so they do go on the attack. Um, and I think <laughs> I don't want to sell on Nancy's side, but I like I understand like like we've said about Nancy having power for the first time in my life, having someone else trying to take it away from you because they don't like what you've done with it. Again, I I see like it's not a surprise to me that Nancy reacts the way she does. Um, in that she's she's literally like fighting to keep this thing that like she wants to she doesn't want anyone more powerful than her to be able to do anything to her to take it away um and i love that last sequence i love the last sequence in sarah's house Mm -hmm. where you know they're all using all their powers and it feels like that's it feels like incredibly like horror like the big horror scene like it's like being in a haunted house at that point Mm -hmm. there's all this stuff happening there's like snakes and maggots and spiders and rats and everything and um they're making Sarah see things and you know she's terrified um and it's interesting because Rochelle and Bonnie leave quite early Mm -hmm. so it does become just this showdown between the two most powerful people in that group in that particular coven yeah and it just seems like what it shows is that because Nancy's leading with this anger and is always just like I mean, she's always up at an 11, <laughs> like consistently. Yep. <laughs> there is a zero chill in that girl, like at all. So, um, you, it just, it, like, it's just her control. Like, it's not even that, what am I trying to say? It's not even that Nancy necessarily using the power wrong. 
is that she has no I don't I think Nancy being Nancy mm-hmm. is not wrong and even if she used the power to kind of like subtly punish people all the time whatever mm-hmm. I don't really think that would be wrong I think it's more that because she leads with anger she's never in control of it because her emotions are always fully fully that one emotion is always yes. fully leading it Yes. Whereas even though like in her despair, like that's when Sarah connects the spirit mm-hmm. and gets stronger and such, but she's so calm in a mm-hmm. lot of those, like, those last sequences and she's using it from a place of like stability and that's really her strength. I don't think she's necessarily a better witch than Nancy. Yeah. It's that she, her strength comes from like how stable she is using it and how thoughtfully she's using it. Um, and Nancy's like at this point incapable of doing that. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't even know what to do when she starts, re- when she realizes that when it becomes less of a cat and mouse of like Nancy chasing Sarah around the house mm-hmm. and Sarah starts like showing that she's powerful. Nancy doesn't even really know what to do in a lot of those scenes. Mm-hmm. She's just kind of panicking. Um, and even when the bugs start coming on her and stuff, she's just a bit like, what's going on? She doesn't even understand how this could be happening to her. Mm-hmm. because she's not thoughtfully thinking about magic as a thing that's like connected her to her to Sarah and her to the earth and her to the world and all that stuff mm-hmm. so it's really interesting I am always going to be sad that Nancy ends up in a hospital like strapped down to mm-hmm. a bed be like forever that's her life now and I'm like she was a teenager with issues and now this is her life um because you know she got a bit like like power mad got a little bit drunk on the old magic <laughs> who hasn't been there you know who it, knows? it also feels like like punishment like she she's punished yeah. because she's angry she's punished because she's power hungry uh and yeah. and even though kind of we understand why she wants that power it's like she takes it too far so she must be completely uh erased yeah. instead of you know just knocked back a bit like rochelle and bonnie are knocked back a bit but you know, they they say that they've kind of lost their powers and whatnot. Sarah hasn't, which is yeah. you know the the little the second ending that we get in the film. It's kind of a it's kind of like a toe the line type message from Sarah as well. Where yeah. I was like, well, you know, sure. So I completely agree with your reading. It's like she's the she prevails because she's ha- has a better handle on her emotions and her powers than yeah. Nancy does. Nancy kind of goes full beast and then loses loses control of what she even can do and she's kind of tricked by the magic that she thought she she could control and could own and yeah. and it's sad that like she's not really offered the opportunity to claw her way back from that like she's yeah. she's so powerful so capable all she needed to do really was to learn to manage it better manage her anger better and I think that's one of the things with the craft. I think that's why it's it's so quintessentially nineties as well, just for the fact mm-hmm. that they make a very good, like a very clear marker of like good and bad mm-hmm. between Nancy and Sarah. And the good girl is the pretty, like white middle class like girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like not only demonstrably good, she's also she looks like the like and it and Nancy looks like the villain. Yes. And she ends up being the villain. And it's just like and like her social circumstances mm-hmm. and her like own conflicts have no bearing on why maybe she would behave different maybe why she'd have less of a hand of emotions than sarah does mm-hmm. because sarah's had everything she's needed to like even though like sarah's been through she like tries to kill herself when her like you know when she at a certain point she's a teenager right mm-hmm. but she's obviously got help mm-hmm. with it she's obviously been looked up do you know I mean it's like even those things they aren't really addressed um and I feel like the fact that all the girls separate mm-hmm. is also always a bit sad. Like when the girls come yeah. to see her, like the fact that they come to see her and like, yes, kind of a shit apology, but they come, they make the effort to come and apologize mm-hmm. without powers anymore. They still want to like kind of be around Sarah. And it makes me sad that they've kind of lost that friendship or that connection too. Mm-hmm. So now like as the sun, it becomes okay for Sarah to have all this power on her own because she can handle it. It's like, it kind of it signifies that she's like a better person mm-hmm. than all of them. I'm like, is she, why is she a better person than Rochelle or Bonnie? Like, I don't know. So it's just kind of, it, it's very 90s. I feel like it'd be like, I feel like those, some of the, I think it stands up this film. Like mm-hmm. I still love watching it, but I think some of those choices, if it was made now would have to be different. 
um, or just more explored at the very least. Mm. Um, but I do think it's interesting that actually, uh, kind of in terms of pop culture impact and stuff like that, the person, the people, I mean, the image of the craft, the iconography mm-hmm. of the craft is always Nancy. And actually, yeah. that's the character that people, I think, connect with very, very strongly in different ways because of that, like, because she is, uh, she is presented as a villain, but I never thought of her as a villain at no. all. I thought of her as like a fallen character who who goes down the wrong path. But it's kind of, you know, in all of these like think pieces and, and reclamations and stuff like that, one of the characters that's always been talked about is Nancy Downs and kind of how she, she got down dirty by her own friends and her own film. Yes, those are the things that have kind of aged worse in terms of narrative, but at the same time, it kind of it kind of still works because it makes us at least it makes me root for Nancy even more the fact that she is um punished too severely for yeah. for being a, a a kind of a very angry and power hungry teenage girl and i think it's also the fact she ends up in an institution is like we know what place like that, especially for women especially young women mm-hmm. there's high like it's so doubtful to ever get out of there and it's just like that's a very scary place for her to have ended up and what I don't she just doesn't deserve that life mm-hmm. um no one does but like you know it's really like hard to see her in there mm-hmm. and um yeah I think as teens because Nancy like Nancy was my favorite she's the most memorable mm-hmm. she's the most dramatic she's what like you would imagine a teen witch would be mm-hmm. um and I also think because I think even then when it, we saw it when we were younger, mm-hmm. it's not, it doesn't feel too far, the stuff that she does because of the reason she's doing it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, if I was a teen witch, I would be doing absolutely mad shit. Like, <laughs> I would be like, I just, I'd be a millionaire. I'd be like, um, I don't know, man. Like, I'd be doing absolutely insane shit. I look different every day. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I'd i have like, I don't know, like a million wardrobes full of clothes. Like it would just be like, I'm like, she's, I, it, 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 you're watching her being like, I get why she's angry. But also if, if I was this angry, if I was Nancy, no one would be safe. Like, <laughs> honestly, I would have fully carried the shit out of that school. Like, and the fact that she doesn't, I'm like, so, you know, she could have just murdered everybody. Like, to be fair. Um... So I think, you know, I think, yeah, there's a reason to team you even you were on Nancy's side. Mm. So like, she's not doing all this mad shit. Like, I would be absolutely punishing everybody. She didn't even try to punish Chris initially. <laughs> initially. She, doesn't, she doesn't hurt him until he hurts her friend. Like That's a and, self-control. Uh, right? Because immediately, the minute I had power, I'd be like, I know what I'm going to do first. <laughs> I'm going to punish Oh Every God. single guy who's an asshole. Um, like it would be My little black book of people who fucked up yeah. fucked me over would be like deployed instantly if I had magical uh. powers. As an adult woman, not even as a teenager. <laughs> you know, like that TV show Why the Last Man, it'll be like that. Yes. Where there's like one man left, I'd be like Yeah, like I left one. Yeah, um, Matt Smickles. But like it would be <laughs> Yeah, it would just be Mad Smickles and we worked him in. It would just be Mad Smickles and alone. Just, you know, just my private concubine. Um, but like, <laughs> I would be, could you imagine trying to get, like, getting celebrities to turn up at your house? I would be in, out of control. And I don't even have, like, the things that Nancy has going on. It's like, mm-hmm. I would be out of control. So you know what? She does have restraint. Considering she's already Nancy, like, she has a huge restraint. Um, and she doesn't want to be, however, Nancy never, never wants to be anything other than her. Mm -hmm. She actually doesn't want to change herself in any way. Mm -hmm. Um, she thinks she's great. (laughs) And I agree. I (laughs) also agree. She's right. (laughs) Also, her fucking outfits are amazing. Every single one of them in this film. Every single one of them. I still, I still want every single item of jewelry she wears. I still want everything that nancy has she's great she has a noose in her locker i know i don't know for what except to like dramatically lean against her locker but you know what it fucking works it fucking works exactly she has a look and back in the 90s when everyone kind of had this kind of homogenous just like kind of 
baggy plaid look. Mm -hmm. I'm like, to stand out in that school, (laughs) it's like, she's, and that's what I mean. She like literally puts on war paint every day Mm -hmm. and goes to school where like loads of people despise her. Mm -hmm. And she does it every day without fail. She's not even like bunking off. She's Mm -hmm. literally there. She turns up and just gets through it and has, she like, she laughs with her friends. She goes to her classes. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm like, she's not actually that bad. She's had to like, armor herself she's literally had yes. to become this person um, and, and also like we kind of have to talk about Faruza Ball because she I mean we know she took it super seriously she's a mm. she's a practicing Wiccan in real life and she really has kind of always gone on the record being like she took the craft and Nancy very seriously as a role because the fact that magic had always been portrayed and you know you could argue like teenage girls as well or teenagers in general have always been portrayed Mm -hmm. as very silly or flighty and she really goes for it with nancy she imbues her like you say with so much rage but also this determination to like not be uh stopped by anyone Because she knows Mm. it is unfair. Like, she's been dealt a lot of very fucked up unfair cards. And she will deal with them as best she can. um, Or as problematically as she can. But like you say, she'll show up. She'll be there at school. She'll go to that party. She will not let other people stare her down. And I think as a Mm. teenage girl, when you see that, it's really quite something. Like, it really really kind of shows you that you can channel that that strength and kind of not in a kind of you know hashtag empowering way but in a way like if you're being bullied if you feel like you're an outsider if you feel different from people in any way having that like war paint and that armor really really sticks with you as a girl yeah and i think that's what's so special about the magic in this film is that there's there's an idea which comes back in a lot of like films about witchcraft especially Mm -hmm. that women inherently all have the power it's just connecting to it Mm -hmm. and finding the right people to share it with or it can be passed down like it is for Sarah from her Mm mum like the idea that there's like a there's a natural sisterhood Mm -hmm. that exists whether you like it or not Mm -hmm. is like something quite nice and so what also like not to bring up old Chris again but the fact that he's kind of the reason they all get together Mm-hmm. The, in, make four eventually anyway but Sarah joins them and the reason they all stop like hanging out is so annoying <laughs> like it's I'm, I'm glad they came together in hate of him but it really upsets me <laughs> that they that he's also like his death is like like he still had an impact after he was gone and like it split them all up but like I love the idea of this magic being there which it does come back like often that like women just they're connected to nature they're connected to each other um it's even like the idea of like the full moon and cycle syncing up and all that stuff it's just um and they do bring up stuff like um nancy even brings up a period at the very beginning of the film yeah. i'm just like i love that you're making this it's about womanhood and about yes. like um finding this power within mm-hmm. like in your in your in yourself but also finding your allies mm-hmm. and and how much powerful like power there is And I think even though it is annoying about Chris being the reason, I'm like, I'm glad he's the only real love interest in the whole thing Mm -hmm. because they're not really running around. They're not doing that. They're not running around like trying to date lots of boys and stuff like because that's not their focus. They have something more important to focus on, which is their group and their power and their magic and having fun with each other. And even when it gets out of hand, that's still their focus. Um, And even like, if though Bonnie wants like attention, she doesn't really place it anywhere specific. Mm-hmm. She just wants to feel normal. And I love that. Um, that's really at the bottom of it, at the bottom of all their sources of power, all their reasons. And the reason it feels like Bonnie and Rochelle lose their power is not because, yeah, I'm sure it has to do with the fact they're not around Nancy or Sarah anymore. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like it's because in some way, like, well, in the film, they betrayed that power Mm -hmm. which is the reason it's taken it like so rather than it being like a oh no you don't have it it's like i'm I'm pretty sure that they were magic on their own too it's more that they betrayed it and so then i don't have it anymore um it's like part of punishment but um yeah i do i do love that i do love Mm -hmm. that connection i do love that in some ways all of the girls have had to like steal themselves apart from sarah Mm -hmm. (laughs) like literally but like the other three girls who have been in that school for however long I've had to find ways to come in every day and be okay with their experience of that. Mm. Um, and, and yeah. 
And before we start wrapping up on, on the craft, I wanted to ask you, you know, where do you think you see, where do you see some of the the influence of the film? Um, and and why do you think we keep coming back to it? I think because it's one of our best examples of that teen genre genre where we feel like we got whip girls who were yes involved in magic and witchcraft and whatever, but felt like real characters, felt like really well written characters. Um, felt like actual people um, who were individuals um, and the focus really stayed on them. Like what I was just saying about there not being other love interests. It's like, yeah, because that's not really what the film's about. It's really about them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's like a blueprint for a lot of stuff. That's how you kind of start with that stuff. You make it about teenage girls just hanging out with each other and wanting to like spend time with each other and joke with each other. And there's something quite nice about it. And it Mm -hmm. feels that not that many films back then were necessarily doing that in a way that they in in that same way. Um and I think it's influences. Um there's is that a film called Seance? It's on it's on Shudder right now. Yeah. yeah. Even like every time I see a thing where girls like do a Ouija like all group of girls and they don't like each other some in some ways or they have to band together to do something. I'm like, this it reminds me of the craft. And I'm just like, I feel like you couldn't even it being four girls, I don't know. I feel like it's so much has impl- like so much has been imbued, even in like very subtle ways. And like every time I see women having to like come together to do this thing or be more powerful together, even like Practical Magic does. It. I think it's a couple of years later, Practical Magic comes out, which you know is kind of ends the opposite way, where all the women find their power and come together to like banish this one man. And which I mean, it's not that dissimilar. Um, and even like stuff like Fear Street is, you know. Very, it's about women connecting over time, um, and generations. Um, like it, there's there's a lot of Jennifer's body, like even like the fact that um, uh, what's her face, Amanda Seyfried's character, is, like gets some of Jennifer's power, even though she's one. Like I don't know, there's like all these things that always remind me of the craft. Even the levitating scenes of Jennifer's body when they're fighting at the end, like. It's, it's in everywhere <laughs> it's all like and I do think that the craft has like a lot of influence all that stuff has like snuck its way into like the mind I think you couldn't make one of those films without having that in your head I'm sure like those filmmakers would have watched that film as like part of their research or or something um I also love that like I mean it's just an era isn't it like all the music in the craft reminds me of like every time Buffy and the gown were in the bronze. <laughs> just like, oh my God. <laughs> there was just like one sound for this era and it was this. <laughs> but it like just feels like, it feels like being in the bronze. I was like, this is hilarious. But, well, um, they literally use the music that they use in the craft in the um, the opening credits of Charm. Like Charmed. they're literally yeah. lifted. They're like, if there's teens being somehow supernatural, here's the music for that. And it's just all the music you ever heard in Buffy or in Charmed or in The Craft or any film of that time. <laughs> but yeah, I just think, I think, I think The Craft is like, I don't know. It's just, it really is something that is a, a milestone or like a, a sign. I, I don't know. It's something that is, is always, I think, going to be looked back on as a marker of one of those films. It's like the start of a kind of genre, at least a, a, a major point in the genre. Um, and it's a good one. And like you said, like, I still watch it. I st- it doesn't, I would never be upset about watching the graph. <laughs> uh, like ever. <laughs> I'm never not going to watch it. It's just great. Like, I, like once you want, it's like a film you want to show, like if you had like nieces or, or whatever, or nephews or, or kids or you, you, this is a film you'd want to show them at some point. You'd want them to see um, and want them to, and hope they liked. It's that film. It ha- it holds that much like nostalgia and like meaning for me. Anyway, and not because I think it, it deals with anything particularly serious, or but because I'm like, it's nice to see teenage girls have representation like this and see them be powerful and like mm-hmm. make bad decisions and be bad even. Like I don't know, like I I think it's great for that, and it's also a lot of fun. It's it is fun. super fun. Yeah, I'm kind of tempted to try to to try to do the spells again. I mean, <laughs> why not? You know, like why not? Why not? Is is it much different from like manifesting or like setting it's your the intentions? Same thing. It? It's the same thing. <laughs> the way that kind of witchcraft keeps coming back and 
whatever new format it keeps coming back in, kind of whether it's witch talk or manifesting or this like widespread cultural obsession with tarot and astrology, it kind of all harkens back to the same thing that the craft was tapping yeah. into, doesn't it? Which is what I like about the spells. It's like the fact that it's not like I'm saying something in Latin. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I'm speaking what I want into existence. And th- which is literally language we use now um, to talk about like getting a job or what. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. speaking into the universe or speaking stuff into existence. Like, so I'm like, it's, it doesn't feel dated because we, the, the, like, it still feels like something that people do now. Um, you know, people use crystals and like, like do, it's like, there's, the people do rituals now. You might not call it witchcraft, but is it that far off from the witchcraft where, that were being seen in the craft? And I feel like it was really brave to shy away from doing it, like, mm-hmm. to like not lean into like making it incredibly witchy and incredibly impossible to achieve and like, you know, this and to like over, dark o- thing. And to overpower with unnecessary mythology, um, which yeah. a lot of films subsequently have tried to do. It's like, that's not the point of it. That's not why we yeah. care. We care because when they're performing their rituals, we're performing their, sp- they're performing their spells. They are, they're really naked. Like they're really vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, you know, even especially the scene that always gets me is when Bonnie, and Bonnie has Nancy try to perform a spell on her scars and she's just kind of there they're in one of the the girls' room and you know yeah. she's she's got her bare back and you know that it's so difficult for her to to show that and yeah. she's just kind of rocking back and forth and saying you know please take my scars please take my scars and it's so heartbreaking and even Nancy it's- kind of stops the spell because it's it's so vulnerable of her and kind of that's where it all comes from and it has it doesn't have anything to do with you know the mythology of Manon or anything like that it's just about really 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 wishing for something to be different so she could feel more like herself yeah that seems really moving and that's what I mean about the girls being incredible actually feeling like they are actually incredibly close because of that to to even like be openly believing in that and like really committing to it as it like I don't know I'm like they're really they trust each other you have to trust each other because you get the impression as well that they're kind of inside each other's heads um as after a certain point once they're connected and it's like so they, they're spending all this time together and they already know what each other feels and thinks and whatever and I'm like they trust each other at this point mm-hmm. and it's also what I mean about the, it being really really fundamentally about them in a way that even films now don't achieve where they make things about teenage girls, especially in the sense that the fact that they pared down the spells to just them speaking stuff into existence. It's like, it's about them and their power and their connection. There is nothing else in this room to give the impression that it's something else or something that's been given to them. Like, yes, we know about Manon, but now Manon's consequential. It just represents like more power from like whatever the beyond, whatever mm. the real key is that the four of them found each other and that they are connected to each other. And I really love that that's like where the the main focus and intrigue and like joy and interest of the film lies mm. in when they're all together in a scene um, and when they're doing magic. Sora, thank you so much. Is there anything that we haven't touched on about the craft that you wanted to bring up? I don't think so. I don't know. I, I brought up the guy with the snake who dies. Who yes. Forgets. I, mean, <laughs> I just wanted to give him a shout out because everyone's forgotten. This poor guy, this poor actor in real life who running around being like, I was in the craft. It's like, no one remembers you. Oh, no one remembers you died. No justice for snake. snake guy. Justice for snake it's guy. Justice for snake guy. Um, I also, um, we've talked about this before as well, about teen films where like mm-hmm. just the absentee parents I also yes. love that this is one of those films. Mm-hmm. They are just sleeping at each other's house every night. They're just running around on the beach all night, casting spells. Um, like, in Sounds no, legit. Like, you see parents, yeah. <laughs> you see parents, like you see um, Bonnie's mum, like Bonnie and Nancy's mum, you probably see the most. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just also love that they're these, like, they've had to figure, they, their parents didn't even get an inkling that anything's going on. <laughs> Which is like even funnier. <laughs> They're literally doing magic and their parents have no clue um, that anything's even different. Um, and I kind of love that again, which again, I think you couldn't necessarily do now, which is this idea of these like lawless children who can do do all this stuff, have the time and the space to actually achieve all these things mm-hmm. without a parent calling on a mobile phone or I don't know, whatever. Like it's quite easy to separate. Um, 
and I quite like that they do go through all of it. They, the only adult they seek help from is the woman who runs a shop. Mm-hmm. And even then, like, you know, Sarah asks her, but then doesn't, she, she gets scared and leaves before she gets fully or anything. Mm-hmm. So I kind of love that it's just them who get the power, who figure out how to use it, who then like, I don't know, who then lose it, who go through all the things they go through. Mm. Um, yeah. Another fave. Thank you so much for your insight for your time and for taking out that slimy little 90s motherfucker that Chris little Hooker prick. that little fuck <laughs> listen have words. if I ever talk to that if I ever meet him as an actor I'm just gonna be like we just need to discuss you in the 90s <laughs> because I need to know <laughs> how you were actually treating women because I have questions but um yeah he's a little and I don't feel bad for him at all like not even a little bit Nancy was right Mm-mm. Nancy's always right <laughs> I believe in a Nazi supremacy. So <laughs> that's a, that's a clip for this episode. Thank you very much for that. Where can people find more of your work online, Isora? You can follow me on Twitter um, at Isara underscore BB. <laughs> I remember mm-hmm. the first time, and also follow me on Instagram at Isara Soros. Um, you can also read my. I've just finished a year actually of bloody perfect columns, which I write for Bloody Women under the final girls on the final mm-hmm. girls website um it's been 12 12 months of bloody perfect and they've um, all been bloody perfect they've all been bloody perfect oh thanks so you can read 12 you can like literally you can um binge <laughs> i don't know if you can binge articles or columns but you can um of mine a year's worth the last one's about the thing which is very Christmassy and fun because it's snowing. That's my only connection to Christmas in it. But I'm like, there's snow, it's, it's fine. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find all my stuff. That's where I'll post everything. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. A joy as always. Always the most fun. Mm-hmm.